welcome everyone. Um, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today for this very special event. Um, welcome to the 2021 Levitt Lecture Series. I am uh, Myra Muramoto, um, new chair of the Department of Family Medicine, and it's my great pleasure to open this event and introduce our speakers. First of all, let me tell you about the Levitt Lecture Series. Dr. Lewis P. Levitt was born in Denver in 19, excuse me, 1896 and graduated from the University of Colorado School of Medicine in 1927. He practiced medicine in Denver until 1967. When he died in 1978, he bequeathed $75,000 to the Department of Family Medicine to establish an endowed lecture center, which is the Distinguished Levitt Speaker Series. Today's Levitt Lecture is very special. This is the second annual C-STAR Greg White Lecture. C-STAR stands for Community and Students Against Healthcare Racism, and it is a group of students and community members that have been working to reduce the effects of racism and bias on health outcomes for Black and Brown communities since the group was founded in 2010. This lecture honors founding community member Greg White, who cared deeply about his community and especially about disseminating important knowledge around health equity. I want to acknowledge Greg's family, including his son, Tari, who is with us on Zoom today. Here's a short video to tell you a little bit more about Greg. Greg White. He was a complex person with lots of layers. <laughs> so I think I would describe Greg as someone who was just incredibly committed, uh, really dedicated to working towards health equity and using his own experiences to help inform how we can create a more just healthcare system. Greg was a very unique kind of guy uh, to me. Some of the adjectives that I would use to describe him passionate, um, unapologetic. He was just overall just this wonderful, genuine human being that I think had a really difficult life and in my mind found a way to heal through Sea Star. Hi, I'm Erica Martinez. I am currently a third year resident at Stanford University. Hi, I am Bella Mohapatra. I am a family physician that works at Clinica Family Health. Hi, my name is Mackenzie Garcia. Uh, I'm a fourth year medical student in the MD and PH program at CU. Hello, my name's Michelle Wheeler and I'm a founding member of C-STAR. I think that C-STAR really meant a lot to him because it was one of his ways of using all of his um, experiences with racism and the trauma associated with that to make our community better. He helped create C-STAR. He chose to invest in us and chose to teach us because he wanted to make healthcare better for people. I think he valued most the relationships that he had with the students. He really thought that they were going to change the world in terms of, you know, getting rid of racism in healthcare. He always kept us on track. He would all, always steer the conversation back to, so what are you going to do? And, and, and not just the individual. What are you going to do as a group? What is C-STAR going to do as a group to end you know, racism in healthcare? So this is a letter that I uh, wrote to Greg. It was really just more of a personal reflection for me. I wrote it the night that he died. Dear Greg, I should have written this when I could have read it to you in person, but I missed that chance. So this is the best I can do. Actually, the best I can do is work throughout my life like you did to make the world a better place. I promise to listen to my patients with my whole heart, to consciously evaluate my own biases and the impact that my perceptions have on other people, and to work with others to create the world that you envisioned. I know I'm going to be a better physician and a better surgeon for my patients because I met Greg. I think that his legacy was that each of us are going to carry a little bit of him to all of our patient encounters, to all of the um, projects that we're a part of, speaking on behalf of all students and all current physicians, residents, everyone who has interacted with the C-STAR community. 
I feel very confident in anyone who has known him that they are going to continue to work to fight against racism and discrimination in every way, shape, or form. Our speakers today are two people who have intimate knowledge of the impact of policing, policy, and gang, and gang violence on the health of Black communities. They will speak today about their work that is focused on Northeast Park Hill, an area we live near and serve. Julian Rubenstein is an award-winning journalist, author, and educator. He is best known for his long-form magazine journalism and his nonfiction books, which include Ballad of the Whiskey Robber, and most recently, The Holly, Five Bullets, One Gun, and The Struggle to Save an American Neighborhood, which takes place here in Northeast Denver. Julian was raised in Denver and studied journalism in New York at Columbia University. He is currently a visiting professor of documentary journalism at the University of Denver. His work has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Rolling Stone, and many other publications. On a local note, Julian's father did his psychiatry residency here at the University of Colorado and practiced in Denver. Terrence Roberts is a community activist who was born and raised in the Park Hill neighborhood in Denver. Growing up, Roberts was a member of the Bloods, a gang in North Park Hill. His lifestyle led him to commit criminal acts that landed him in prison for a number of years. When he got out of prison, he dedicated his energy to helping youth in the neighborhood stay off the streets. He started a nonprofit organization called The Prodigal Son, but working within a neighborhood with a personal history with a gang was extremely complicated. And the events that developed are the heart of the book, The Holly, written by Julian Rubenstein. Today, we will hear from Mr. Rubenstein on the research and book he wrote, and then we will have that opportunity to talk with Terrence Roberts about his thoughts and experience on how communities are affected by the complex interaction of policing, policy, and gang violence. Please join me in welcoming Julian and Terrence. Thank you. So I was gonna, I, I would tell you some of the things, of course, that led me to write this book, which takes place in a community, which we'll sort of see as a case study in some of the issues that we're gonna look at today in terms of gang violence, policing, and community health, and even community trauma. I think that was mentioned in the introduction of Greg. Um, uh, when I, um, I first came to the story in 2013 when I read a story about um, uh, the arrest of an activist who had been a former gang member. His name was Terrence Roberts, um, and uh, he had he, he was had been done some amazing activism he'd also been a blood gang member and he was also working at the time of this shooting he was running an anti-gang program that in fact had federal funding uh, through the city of Denver um, and of course I was very curious what what could have possibly gone wrong um, and and what happened and I was able to reach Terrence he was then um, up on charges and I'll get circled back to some of his story, and of course the book chronicles it um, in detail. Um, but just to tell you a little bit about the community that we're dealing with and some of the demographics, and and um, uh, to kind of place yourself in a in that context. I mean, we're talking about a in a, in the city anyway. I mean, nationally, roughly fourteen percent African American in Denver, which is the most diverse city in this state. 53% white, 31% Hispanic, and about eight to 10 African American, which has been decreasing. Um, and part of the reason that it's been decreasing, well, there's many reasons, but that it does include the fact that the city has under, been undergoing a pretty rapid gentrification in some of those neighborhoods that have been the most affected by that have been the African American community. Um, some of the, uh, um, I'm looking at my notes on a much smaller thing now, so I'm, let me adjust myself. Um, so it's, we're basically looking at like a, what, you know, what I would consider to be a subset, ultimately, of even this community and a subset of the uh, African American community, which is the gang community specifically um, in Northeast Park Hill. And part of the reason I would say that it's a subset, I mean, 
the African American community in Denver and elsewhere, of course, has some of the worst um, uh, statistical findings and things such as health, uh, such as things like PTSD, um, income, the income inequality, and uh, unemployment. But in particular, this uh, community has um, also been one that has been the focus for decades of law enforcement. And just to give you sort of a sense of which sort of will ultimately, you know, address some of the questions and issues that are difficult to deal with about trust, um, the uh, juvenile justice system confines black youth at four times the rate of white youth. Um, you can see in this chart, um, actually, of, of course, whites uh, are the least Hispanic. Uh, this is um, rate per 100,000. The next, American Indian, and then far the worst, the African American community. And in Col this is a, here's a chart that shows Colorado's um, uh, how they fare within the United States uh, and compared to other NATO and mostly Western countries around the world. You can look at the incarceration rates are off the charts, nowhere close. Even Colorado is nowhere close to any other country in terms of how many uh, people we incarcerate. And we know that by race and ethnicity, the number one race that is incarcerated is the African-American community in Colorado. Um, the other thing that I thought, and we've talked about it a little bit in some of the meetings I've had and was brought up, I guess, I think in the introduction to Greg, is that this is a community that without a doubt, so when I started working on this, I was uh, working at the time at, uh, at a part-time job at Columbia University at the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma. And one of the things that it that I had discovered in some of my research there was that the studies had shown that in African American communities, the PTSD rates were higher than that of returning veterans. And I found just one study, and I think there's many out there, but this is a study from 2005 from researchers, uh, medical researchers at Texas and Emory University found that of 184 African Americans visiting a clinic in Atlanta, 36% men, 64% women, 43% had PTSD measured by a, um, a symptom, uh, sorry, that's by a symptom uh, uh, study that they used or, or a, a way that they diagnosed it, yet only 11% had a diagnosis. And these were some of the findings. 55% said they'd been attacked with a knife, gun, or other weapon in their life. Another 55% also attacked without a weapon with intent to kill. 48% said they didn't experience serious accident or injury. 39% experienced childhood sexual abuse. So these are just some of the profile you know, issues that we're dealing with in, um, in not only the African American community, but that would be consistent with the uh, findings I had in reporting over seven years um, this story, this book. Um, you know, just to give you a, a brief and um, run through the the background of what Northeast Denver African Americans have experienced and the history of it, um, Clarence uh, uh, Morley. In 1925, was the governor of Colorado. He was a member of the KKK. You might know Benjamin Stapleton, the longest serving mayor ever of Denver, served five non consecutive terms, um, ending in 1947. He was a member of the KKK. And um, these were people whose influence really ha was significant over places like the uh, over Five Points, which this is the Rosonian. Uh, hotel um, there. I'll, I'll sort of skip my, I was going to do a small reading from Jack Kerouac who commented on his experience in Five Points, but I don't want to get too far behind. Um, basically, what happened in 1947 was Quig Newton, shown here with I think his other CU, uh, he was at one point the president of CU, but he became the progressive mayor who was able to beat Stapleton, in it, who was going, I guess, for his sixth term. 
and he envisioned a purposeful integration of another neighborhood in um, Denver, the only neighborhood at the time that was officially um, and unofficially, I should say, allowing African Americans to live in it was Five Points. And sort of as that was pushing out, uh, because the population was increasing, there were neighborhoods like Whittier. But at the time, real estate brokers, banks, and others through what's known as what has you know become known as redlining did not allow African Americans to live in other parts um, of the city and. There was a new neighborhood called Northeast Park Hill, which is at the very top of a very august neighborhood and a historic neighborhood in Denver called Park Hill. Um, this is a photo of the very first year the Holly Shopping Center opened in 1955. The Holly Shopping Center is the center of my book and also certainly for those residents I see um, probably from the neighborhood and uh, maybe others know this shopping center ended up basically being claimed by the Bloods as the first headquarters of the original first Bloods gang in Denver. But here it is in its inception. And um, it, what, what was going on in the neighborhood at the time is it was actually built as a sort of lower middle class neighborhood. Mostly white people were living there in, in 1960 uh, when it first started to become integrated. And it was actually almost all white. It was uh, a lot of uh, servicemen who worked at the, the now defunct uh, Air Force Base, Lowry Air Force Base, where my father also was the base psychiatrist for five years. And um, and and uh, the, 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 the neighborhood was actually full of activists. Uh, they welcomed Martin Luther King. Uh, here's, a, here's a photo of, um, this is Lauren Watson, uh, the head of the Denver Black Panthers who lived in Whittier but was very interested in Northeast Park Hill and the events that were going on there. What happened as the 60s kind of continued, this neighborhood became under extreme turmoil and became one of the most classic and extreme cases of white flight on record. From 1960 to 1970, this neighborhood, once all white, became almost entirely all black and was fighting, really, for its rights. Uh, there were several activists, Lauren Watson among them, who were starting to see, among the other disparities that were with education, um, jobs, um, and uh, health, and things like there was been a food desert there forever. There was also police misconduct that was going on. And just a couple months after Martin Luther King was assassinated in Memphis in April, there was, in fact, a now you know infamous and important historic police shooting right in Holly Square on June 24th, 1968. Uh, Nathan Jones, uh, an 18-year-old resident, was shot. And that was the incident that kicked off Denver's civil rights movement and era, really. Um, it, it was, there were a lot of demands uh, that were made. Um, but it was also, like many other places, this happened literally, I guess, four to five months before the election of Richard Nixon. And the, be and the, the next day, as the story goes, I was fortunate to be the last person to interview Lauren Watson, the former leader of the Black Panthers. And it was an interview, by the way, talking about trust that took years for me to get. I had been working and working to try to get it and to try to gain his trust. Um, and because I was white and because I was not from the, from the community. And that's all stuff we can talk about, of course. Um, but Nixon was elected, and then morning after, a, a Denver policeman who Lauren knew approached him and said straight to him with his fist pumped, white power. And uh, to me, that was very significant and really kind of showing the, the turning of the tide with the election of Nixon because... That comment was a clear reference to what had become known as black power and the black power movement of which the Panthers were a part of. But the FBI's J. Edgar Hoover um, is, was someone who already had a program to dismantle, disrupt, and take down black activists and black leaders. And I'm mentioning this because it's something that you know I ended up going far deeper into in my book, and the reason was that the echoes of the story I was working on, the echoes of the past were just resounding. 
and we'll get to that. But what was going on at the time was a condoned federal program to take out activists, and they took out Lauren Watson. He was actually removed from an elected position that he had by J. Edgar Hoover. He was told he could not work on it anymore. There's a man here, Bunchy Carter. He was the leader of the LA uh, Black Panthers, and I mentioned him because he was a former gang member he, of the Slossons. There's a lot of connections throughout this story and that are important to understand between gang, ma- gangs and activism, and we'll get to, more into that too. Um, but Bunchy, after the Watts riots in 1965, like other black uh, gang members, quit the gang and decided to become an activist. Here's a, a recent photo of uh, from a film, um, someone playing Fred Hampton, the Chicago Black Panthers leader who was assassinated. In and it so Bunchy and and Fred were both uh, assassinated. Bunchy uh, was assassinated uh, by other African Americans in a fomented conflict. The FBI fomented conflict between two groups that resulted in that. The ensuing legal case basically took out both of these groups at an at a critical time. Fred Hampton, as some of you know, has was uh, killed in a hailstorm of bullets by uh, police who raided his apartment when he was asleep. Um, and what happened, and into the sort of, basically the next year after this, I think it's worth mentioning Raymond uh, Washington, who the uh, who is not as, as well known at all, and actually there's not very much written or said about him. I had to go to many sources to get more information about the man who founded what became the Crips. Raymond Washington in 1970, he was living in a neighborhood where he looked up to Bunchy Carter, he knew Bunchy Carter, and he, like other youth, he was in he was in middle school at the time. He wanted to start a group, and he started a group called the Avenue Cribs. Well, among other things, they wore fashion uh, canes as fashion accessories, and ultimately they became known as the Crips. Um, Raymond didn't want to... Uh, uh, d- didn't necessarily think of the Crips as what they became. He thought they were going to be something more like the Panthers, but this was a time when there was a real vacuum of leadership among young black men, lack of role models, and the Crips got out of hand and started ultimately fighting. In fact, Raymond originally was against uh, gun violence. In the 70s, he quickly ended up in prison on robberies. By the time he got out in 1979, Crips tried to hide their guns around him because they knew we didn't like it. But sure enough, a few months later, Raymond Washington himself was dead of a drive-by shooting. And that was at the beginning, not only of a proliferation of weapons into the city of Los Angeles, but it was also at the time when one other figure who is, I think, critical to understanding some of the psychology and the mistrust of authority um, in African-American communities, and that includes here in Denver, is is a man named Ricky Ross, who a young man at the time who was not a gang member but did live in a gang neighborhood. He wanted to be a businessman, and he found and discovered in approximately 1980 that there was a new sensation in the neighborhoods, some small pebble that people could put on a pipe and smoke. It was then known as Ready Rock, and Ricky found his way to the top of the um, supply chain, and soon he was um, selling up to $3 million worth of this drug per day. Um, And I'll get into just a bit about um, where he was getting it from, which becomes significant uh, later, but, um, but this was basically happens right at the time of uh, Reagan's uh, drug war. And Ricky at the time, I think it's important to note too in terms of the way some of these things are sort of uh, unexpectedly turned on their heads is that um, Ricky Ross was uh, a community hero. He, gangsters in many neighborhoods were heroes. 
Um, they had flaunted the system and beaten it. They were able to give out money to people, and they were the real kind of neighborhood saviors in a, in a crooked system that they'd had to figure out how to work around. Um, I guess we'll get to it here, which is just to say that um, the... the um, the videos the other way. The uh, the 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 way that that some of the, this played out was that it turned out that that Ricky Ross's uh, suppliers were a, a couple of Nicaraguans, including this guy here, Danilo Blandone, who turned out to be someone who was funneling his uh, profits back into the effort of the Sandinistas to overthrow the left-leaning Contra government in Nicaragua, and this is something that Reagan heavily supported, uh, once said that with every breath in my body. Um, of course, Reagan had had problems sell, illegally selling weapons to Iran, and it, it turned out the CIA was aware of D Danilo Blandone and uh, what was going on. There's questions about what they were, what they were required to do, to do or not, but of course, by the time this story came out in the 90s, actually broken by a journalist, um, it it heavily uh, called into question what the U.S. government had known about washing cocaine into L.A. during the 1980s at the same time that Reagan and the, and the criminal justice system was exploding into a billion, multi-billion dollar industry. Um, and what happened, though, was that because of the uh, the incredible supply of this drug in L.A., right around the mid-1980s, gang members, who were the ones that Ricky Ross worked with to sell it, decided and realized that they needed to find new frontiers to sell the drug. And, for example, Denver, in fact, was uh, quickly a... Uh, spot on the law enforcement, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, system in which they were noticing that the these gang members had appeared from the West Coast for the first time, and Denver was very much a place of interest because of it. And it was right at this time that uh, that 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 Terrence Roberts, or soon after this, Ter Terrence Roberts was growing up in Northeast Park Hill. And I have a short clip, if we believe we can play it, um, two or three minutes that just shows, introduces Terrence and what life and, and his uh, experience was like at that time and why he joined a gang. If you grew up in the late 80s, early 90s in Northeast Denver, gangs were movements. We're talking about thousands of kids. I became a blood because I really, really loved my community. I didn't become a blood because I like wearing red. I became a blood because that was the representation of the community where I was from. Them days when he was a younger cat and he was protecting the hood. Riding in his car and he had like a Mac 11 on the seat and, and he wasn't doing nothing but riding up and down the blocks making sure that there wasn't no crips, no crabs, nowhere. I mean, because he was protecting everybody. My nickname was CK Showbiz. CK stands for Crip Killer. Showbiz had a demon in him to cause him to want to do wrong to people, especially to Crips. Terrence had a spirit inside of him that you didn't have to be a gangbanger. Just if he wanted to get you, he was going to get you. Fast murders, a lot of shootings. A lot of people got damaged during those times too, man. A lot of PTSD. jail looking at a life sentence. I was already tired of getting shot, getting into fist fights, gang banging. That the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. I had seen this documentary about Martin Luther King. I literally grew up one block south of Martin Luther King Boulevard. I never had heard the speech. I never knew much about Martin Luther King. 
We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now. Because I've been to the mountaintop. He said at the end of his speech, like, when you get to the mountaintop, I won't be there, but God has shown me the vision and all that, like, moving made me want to cry, bro. I'm sitting here with all these big old crips and bloods, you know, <laughs> so it's like, but I felt like tears in my eyes. I was like, man, this is deep. And I was just in my cell. And I was just like, it was like, I kind of stayed up like all night just thinking about my life. And I was just like, you know what? I'm done. I'm just, I like my name. My name's Terrence. I started reading more about activists. And I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, of Martin Luther King. I read Soul on Ice. I read Soul on Fire. It was just, that started seeping into my spirit that that's the kind of person who I wanted to be. So, um, yeah, I should mention that's from a forthcoming documentary that I've directed. Um, I was filming it in the process of uh, reporting the book and um, we are just about done, but we're just, it's exciting to show a few clips from it. But what was interesting, you know, is that Terrence, um, third generation resident of the community, sort of had this, uh, who had gone, almost gone down, and this was, you know, the world that Denver had become, the the the, the bloods, and rather the, the police and the district attorney and major efforts to stomp out the bloods, and Terrence, unlike many of the other friends he was with, did not die, did not stay in prison, although he did a better part of a decade in prison, including in solitary confinement. He comes out and wants to start a, uh, um, a an anti-gang program in a community in which, as you can sort of look at, if you can see the light blue line there, just looking at youth arrests in America, um, you know, blacks had start 15%, but yet 35% of the arrests they make up. And I can tell you from my research into the neighborhood where the Holly is, which is Northeast Park Hill, it has been the site of well-funded uh, law enforcement efforts for decades. Um, and so what was going on at the time that was that there were three efforts to um, try to eradicate gang violence that became sort of the main leading efforts in the 90s. One was started by a guy, David Kennedy, who was then at Harvard. He was studying trends of shootings in Boston and he found that sure enough, like Denver, um, almost all of the shootings were happening in only a few neighborhoods and they were African American neighborhoods. And he found in fact that, that it wasn't just these neighborhoods, but that it was certain so-called what he called impact players. Uh, law enforcement sometimes calls them trigger pullers. And these are the guys who are the most dangerous guys. Um, and he put together a program that was then called Operation Ceasefire. And they were picked up and looked at by the Clinton administration. They started getting utilized in law enforcement efforts. There was another one in which James Comey, the future FBI director, he was running something in Richmond, Virginia, which had a very high um, homicide rate. And that was a program of law enforcement. He actually ran it with Tim Kaine, the future vice presidential candidate, who was then mayor. Um, and I thought it would be interesting to make sure to mention, because it's become quite influential, Gary Slutkin, uh, who started a program then called Operation Ceasefire. It's now called um, Cure Violence. And he's a medical doctor, an epidemiologist, who decided that he, he was interested in looking at violence in Chicago as if it were um, a, a communicable disease or an infectious disease. And he did, the main thing he's known for now is sort of really starting what's called these interrupter style programs. The main thing that I think is of note in particular with these, um, these efforts is that really all of them have been co-opted by law enforcement, which controls the vast majority of funding for anti-gang efforts. 
and measures its success not by reducing gang members or trying to eliminate gangs, but by arrests. That's the measure of success for these programs is how many arrests you make, which does not necessarily indicate anything for community health. Um, so just looking back again at the astonishing rate of arrests in America and in Colorado compared to anywhere else in the world. Um, so this was the milieu, so to speak, into which the Prodigal Son Initiative and Terrence Roberts decided to start his program. Um, he thought it would be interesting or better to try a prevention approach, which is not the way law enforcement does it. Instead of treating the problem like even Cure, Cure Violence was doing, <clears throat> What are the core, what are the reasons this is existing? And of course, some of them include income inequality, lack of role models. Um, and what Terrence was trying to do was create a program that was first really targeted at youth that was steering gang, like basically trying to take away the recruitment. I mean, gangs, if they don't continue to recruit members, are going to die off. Um, so he started a program in Northeast Park Hill that was working with youth. It happened that right around this time, the Holly Shopping Center, which you saw when it first was built in 2008, it was burned to the ground by the Crips. Um, the founder of the Crips, Michael Asbury, was murdered uh, not far from here, actually, um, just over the Aurora, uh, Denver border, border in Aurora. And uh, it, the next night, nine Crips burned down the Holly Shopping Center, which was the sort of sacred adopted home of the Bloods. Um, it was also, of course, something that had been in the community for years. It was the center also of so political and social life for so many years and meant so much to many people. And it, it of course, created a lot of distress and a lot of law enforcement um, efforts and it also created a lot of activism. This is Terrence leading a march after the Holly Shopping Center was burned down, hoping to stop violence. And in fact, what he got into was um, he decided that he wanted to redevelop the Holly and that, in fact, community development could be an entirely new way of addressing gang violence, giving people something to be proud of in their community and to be invested in it. Um, of course, Terrence wasn't the only one who was wanting to redevelop the Holly. And in fact, he faced an incredible array of powerful interests. The Department of Justice, the Denver Police, the Denver Foundation, the Urban Land Conservancy, the Anschutz Foundation, the Boys and Girls Club, these were all entities that, as some of you in the room I, I, I know know, um, became very involved and invested in redeveloping the Holly themselves. In fact, the Urban Land Conservancy bought the Holly. Uh, this is a place that, if you can believe it, given the numbers we see now, it's a 3.3 acre plot, I think. It's, you know, I don't know, maybe sort of three blocks by two blocks. Uh, for something about $500,000. You can't even get a house over there for that. Uh, so they got almost for nothing. Um, the city helped them. Uh, the Denver Foundation helped them. And all of these entities you see here were not only involved in the redevelopment, but were also involved um, in the huge police uh, effort that went on for several years uh, there, including undercover efforts. Um, and Terrence at the time was someone who was starting to find his way as an activist and feeling like, I mean, he was an, an insider. He was extremely outspoken. He was starting to see things that he didn't agree with and he was speaking out about them. He had originally been the founder and first president of the Holly Area Redevelopment Project, uh, which was a way that the new owners of the Holly were trying to involve the community. But he ended up resigning in protest over the way he thought things were being handled. He was going to meetings and protesting what he saw 
in what has become extremely clear as the rapid gentrification of the two most historic black neighborhoods in Denver, Five Points and this neighborhood. Um, and, uh, and what he did, um, what he did start to face was, you know, a number of things that included, uh, so when these law enforcement operations are going on, one of the things that they, that we don't know a lot about, but which they absolutely do include in virtually every case, is the use of informants. And the use of informants is, is problematic evenly, even by admission of most, um, uh, you know, DAs and some police, if they would, I guess, talk about it. I've talked to it mostly on the prosecutor side. It's something that is often seen as, you know, a necessary evil, something that is 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 not always perfect, but is difficult to um, really insinuate yourself into a gang and maybe bust people that you want to without them. But when you look at who's getting busted and who's getting used as informants and what the ultimate effect is, it's really problematic. And there are actually people that I've found in the research of doing this who are across the country in many roles from educators to experts to former law enforcement people who want to, and, and including uh, legislators, who are hoping to get more laws passed. But you know, one one person. I just thought I'd read a couple lines from that that I'd found in a court document of a one of the informants that were used that was used right there in Holly Square to uh, make an arrest uh, in one of these programs right in the year before Terrence ended up shooting this young man. Uh, so he. Um, he testifies. He has to. He he set up. He testifies against his best friend, uh, he, who he he ends up sending away to federal prison for many years. Uh, the guy had asked him and told him that he needed to. I guess he needed. He was looking to buy some drugs. Um, the informant testifies. I set up my friend. I'm not accepted by Park Hill no more. My mom barely accepts me. I'm nobody. I don't remember anything until I set up my best friend. He said, someone like who did that, quote, deserves to die. So I just mentioned it because of the just tragedy all around of, of these situations. Someone who tried to, needed to get out of charges that he was up on, decided to do so by turning on someone else, is, had to end up being moved out of the, uh, actually I don't have no idea where he is, but he went into protection, he, there were, he, he had, there were murder attempts on him. Uh, in fact, also right there in the Holly. Uh, Terrence was there when his car was shot up and they tried to kill him. Um, and sure enough, as the development of, of the Holly Square continues and Terrence continues to become a more powerful activist who's speaking out against police misconduct and who is... Um, uh, speaking out a bunch about the the way that the redevelopment is happening, uh, despite the powerful people that are involved in it, on the night that he is supposed to move into the new Boys and Girls Club, he held a peace rally, uh, during which point he was uh, surrounded and uh, was about to be I, there. He he can tell you his side of it. There's I, I researched this for a long time. I can tell you what I was able to prove uh, through multiple sources. What he was surrounded by gang members, one of whom had significant relationships with the police, and another of whom, who also later admitted to working the police in documents I found, uh, was had put. Had put had put this guy up to it, and in any case, Terrence um, Terrence shot this guy, and uh, on the day he was supposed to move into this crowning jewel of a place that he'd helped campaign for, he ended up not in the Boys and Girls Club that night, but in jail, uh, facing life in prison. Um, and I have one. Um, you all can, or someone can tell me, I have one more, more two-minute clip, and 
Uh, should I show it? Okay, one more clip. It's show, it's about Terence. Um, sort of, you'll get a sense of how his, how adamant he became about fighting his case, despite the fact that he might uh, he knew that he might go to prison for it. This is a brief scene. He was I was um, well. He was fought, he was charged as a habitual criminal. It becomes a significant wrinkle in the case because he was charged as a habitual criminal, which was ridiculous since he had not committed any crimes and was obviously, you know, going the other direction. Uh, but the fact that they ended up adding those charges to his case after he refused to take a plea, which many of you probably know that, you know, forcing people to take plea deals is, is one of the ways that they use their, the system uses power over people in these ways and forces them to plead guilty to something. Terrence refused to do that and continued to uh, speak out on Facebook. And in fact, s almost immediately after criticizing the DA and some other powerful interests, was told he was charged as a habitual criminal, which meant he was going to die in prison if he lost his case. And this was a short scene, an argument he had with his father over how he should handle himself before the trial. Um, I know you want to get your voice out there, but man, the DA and everybody's looking at that, and that's what made them charge you because of the Facebook things that you're saying. What did his voice say? I'm charged with habitual criminal pops. He uh, hasn't done shit. Yes, but he talked to the DA before they post that on you. So, and you know what he did? He said he backed up from it because you won't stay off of Facebook. Nigga, I could get on Facebook if I want, okay, my but nigga. if you looking at life in prison, I shut this motherfucker down. Nigga, and I'm a I priest telling you I, I should be down. able to do it. I'm an activist, pops. Okay, I should say what I want, my nigga. After the I trial. I can get on Facebook if I want. After the trial. Before the trial. How about that? I'm the one looking at the time, not you, my nigga. Everyone wants me silent, my nigga. No. My loud. words are getting me prosecuted. It, not my criminal okay, then, actions, my then, nigga. Then, then just accept the charges. And I'm accepting them. Okay. So don't I'm take here. it to trial. Just go. I'm not about to go to jail because I'm on Facebook. I'm man, in trial. What are you to talking to about? Jail. I'm just saying, man, when you call out the DA, man, that's that's crazy. Man. That's suicidal, The man. DA has not charged these police off. This shit is... That ain't your business. It is my business. Your this business is, my is people. I down. care about that shit. I care about these L4 pops. I care about Michael Brown getting shot 13 times. I care about um, Eric Garner getting choked to death and he's saying I can't breathe. I care about that shit, pops. It matters to me, my nigga. Black lives matter, my nigga. Yeah, I am angry because it's bullshit. What if it was another young black leader? He should be able to post what he wants about the mayor of Chicago. I'm not afraid of these niggas, Pops. I'm not afraid of the DA's office. I'm talking about the DA sitting. Fuck Tanti, fuck everybody else. Fuck the DA. Don't say that. Why not, nigga? Because, fuck him. What you talking about? Got your hand, your I'm, in his and hand. I'm charged with habitual criminal. But Why shouldn't I say it? Saying, fuck Lord. him, fuck him, fuck him. Uh, so you can, you, you know, you can see the um, the challenges of 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 wanting to be uh, pure and 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 wanting to be. Um, adamant about what you may be true versus what is going to help you in the system that you're in. Um, and I guess, you know, here's Terrence testifying. He did go to trial, the trials in the movie, we filmed it. Um, I'll just say, uh, sort of to, to, to wrap up, and I guess it's a slight spoiler <laughs> alert, but Terrence in 2020, and thank God, I, you know, I've said, um, good, good thing I uh, missed my book deadline because had I, mi had I missed what happened in 2020, it would have been too bad. Um, the, uh, the events of 2020, as we know, with George Floyd, and actually Terrence was already involved as the leader or co-leader of the Justice for Elijah McClain movement at one point, becoming the literal face of the movement. Um, and becoming someone who was just regularly out there on the protest scene, leading huge marches in Denver and in Aurora, and ultimately um, being arrested. And uh, that part of it is just very 
fascinating and problematic. Uh, he was arrested for on charges, felony charges of inciting a riot, along with several other other protest leaders. Uh, it went on for, I mean, almost a year. Uh, thankfully, they decided ultimately had to admit that they did not have evidence to charge him that way, and the charges were dropped. But you see yet again the appearance of targeting activists in order to undercut um, social movements or equity and equality efforts. Um, and so there's a lot more I can say. I know we got a slightly uh, uh, later start, but I think I should bring up Terrence and uh, you know, you'll know you get a sense of hearing from someone who really was just in the thick of it, an insider from all the way back, going back to his gang days, his prison days, in his days as a powerful activist in Denver who's paid some real prices for that and uh, I think can also help deepen the understanding, obviously, of, of what it's like to be a, um, a member of a community like this. Thank you so much, Julian. Thank you for your research and your book and all of the care you've put in. We see the outcomes, but understanding the background is really new for most of us, so thank you so much. And it's great to have you here, Terrence. We're gonna do a Q&A, and it's a real opportunity to hear Terrence's perspective and experiences. Um, so you can ask away, and Amelia will monitor the chat, so questions will come from that too. So we'll have a microphone to pass to people um, once they both get settled up here on, on these chairs. Thanks. So the question is, how's Terrence feeling about this right now, having seen all of that? Because it's very upsetting to a community member who was involved. Um, it's hard for me to watch myself on television like that because I was so unhealthy mentally and physically. Okay. So like I was saying, it's hard for me to watch myself on Julian's footage on the documentary because... I was so unhealthy and I was very angry and I didn't know if I was going to go to prison so the way I was carrying myself, um, I found out a lot about myself filming this documentary, um, the way I was acting. Even though I was looking at life and I was very frustrated and very upset but still even in those moments I found out a lot about my own character like how much I say the n-word. I don't like, I really changed the amount of times I say the N-word. I try to not say it at all, but I'm young African-American, so I still do when I talk to black people. But things like that, um, the way I carry myself when I get angry, different things. I learned a lot filming this documentary. Um, right now, I feel good because I have a good trajectory in my life, and I'm not doing life in prison. I have a good job. I'm stable. I'm not facing charges anymore. Um, but it's hard for me to watch that footage. Because I know what happened to Park Hill, and I still love my community. And we just had 95 homicides in Denver just last year. And Northeast Park Hill is not a safe place. We've all seen worse than Northeast Park Hill. I, I've, I've worked in Los Angeles. I've worked in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Uh, you know, I, I've been in many places that are more dangerous than Denver. It is not safe in Northeast Park Hill for young African-American men and women if you're not from over there. It's just simply not. Terrence, thanks for being here. Um, it's so great to be able to hear your story, and, and Julian, thank you also. Um, one of the things that comes up a, a lot when we see, um, read books or, or see documentaries or films or even like the movie 13th, you think about all the structures that put people um, in situations like some of the experiences that you had, and it can be hard to stay hopeful what do you tell people about how to stay, as an activist, about how to stay hopeful when they say all these structures are in place um, that are contributing to keeping things the way they are? What, what do you tell people? It's easier to tell people to stay hopeful when you're, when you're getting victories, even though, like I said, we had 95 homicides just last year. I don't even know how many dimmers are on target right now to surpass last year's number, um, as far as I know. And... I don't know if we've ever broken 100 homicides in Denver, right? You know, those are the type of numbers you see in Oakland, California, and places like that per capita, and we're getting there. There's not that many African-American youth in Denver. We're talking about the five points 
we're talking about Northeast Park Hill, right? So with us having less than 10% of African Americans in this city, most of our homicides are young African American and Latino youth. In this city, every single year, every month, there's a gang shooting every day in this city. In Denver, now, I'm not talking about South Central, I'm not talking about Compton, I'm not talking about South Side of Chicago, I'm talking about in Northeast Denver, there's a shooting, and not to leave out the West Side and the North Side with our Latino youth, there's a gang shooting every single day in the city. So even though that looks bleak, but also we're getting a lot of successes. Like in 2010, we only had 10 gang-related homicides. Last year, we had about 85 out of the 95 were more than likely gang-related homicides, not domestic violence, not drug-related. It's people murdering each other over tribalism, and it's the youth. It's, we're not talking about 50-year-old men. We're talking about 15-year-olds, 17-year-olds, 19-year-olds, right? So um, with, with that going on, it, it's hard for people to think that, oh, like things are going to get better. But w we have successes like Senate Bill 217. I see Leslie Harashi just left. But we got Senate Bill 217, the police accountability, police accountability law passed into law. Um, here first in Colorado by Jared Polis on Juneteenth of last year, that was an initiative that my organization spearheaded, right? Then we delivered it to Ms. Harad. And, and, and th that gives us more hope and that gives me more credibility to say, you know, activism is not a fad. It's not like, oh, I was doing it 10 years ago. No, activism is a lifestyle. It, it is something that you do because it comes from your heart. And now it's more of a fad, but there are some of us who really wanted to do this, you know, because this is who we told the board we would be. Um, you know, so besides Senate Bill 217, we also got a no-knock raid ban in Aurora. You know, these are initiatives where we went all out for it and laws are being passed, not just feel-good moments. We're getting actual, tangible things happening for the community like laws to where the police can also, the same way they use those laws against us, now as community members, we could use them against them. Um, I haven't really been on the gang front as much since the shooting because I did lose a lot of credibility um, because I had to separate myself, other gang leaders rose up, um, and, and the gang structure in Denver has changed from eight years from when I was younger and I had a traditional knowledge of the Park Hill Bloods and the Five Point Crips that are in the east side and all those things in Aurora. Now there's more hybrid gangs and different things. So the way we just you know, keep people positive is, I really try to stay focused on, not, I'm not trying to be everyone's activist and everywhere just to be on TV and all that. You know, when I was focused on gangs, uh, when I was able to make an impact there, we focused on that and we made sure that we made an impact. And, and once I transitioned into police accountability, a large part of that is because of what they did to me. I am a victim of police misconduct by them having gang member informants try to murder me, which derailed my life. Um, we stay focused mainly on that because they had paid activists doing anti-gang work. There was no one, especially like a young African-American male, really focused on police accountability here in Denver at the level that we took it to when we knew that, that was going to be necessary. Um, and we're getting successes and that's how people are staying positive because we are winning. We're not just taking a bunch of losses, we're getting a lot of W's too. And I would just quickly add that because I forgot to say that it's true. In 2010, when Terrence's camo movement was at its peak, and that, that was a movement that he was very good at creating excitement around things, and he created this camo movement, which was basically a unity movement. To Instead of wearing red or blue, they were behind this camo flag. And it was at the peak of it in 2010. That's when there were, was it 10 or 20? Now I'm forgetting. It was 10, maybe? 10, yeah, 10 homicides in the city, which was by far the lowest. And there was no question that it was contributing in a major way, in a positive way. Um, and these efforts that are funded and spearheaded by law enforcement, I mean, they're putting a lot of money into it, but the result is the violence keeps going up. Um, so it's, there's, there's a, two different approaches, and it does seem to me that the uh, approach that perhaps doesn't favor a, a system in which you know, the goal is to arrest as many people as you can, maybe the goal should be looking at some of these other ways that are contributing to why people join gangs and, and how can we help this community in other ways. Um, and so, yeah, from, and from a healthcare perspective, I mean, there's just such an array of things that can be um, you know, sort of like utilized or thought about when 
dealing with these communities. Yes, I, um, I really admire you, Ter Terrence and Julian, what you've done. I almost lost three sons to gangs. One of them specifically wanted to be a gang leader. And I found out real quick how sad. I, I couldn't get any help from the system at all. So I'm asking you, what kind of things would you, and you allude to some of them, that can help a young child? And my son was nine years old, wanting to be a gang leader. Um, what can you do uh, to help a young person? And we had to take a whole different turn because we got no help whatsoever. So the reason why gang violence after my incident happened, we feel really started spiking more in Denver is because, and you know, we're talking about children. What there's there's a there's 45 and 55 year old men who want to go party. They want to go gamble up in the hills, right? We're human beings. We, we need a sense of community. Isolation is one of the worst forms of punishment. So when you have a nine-year-old, when you have a 19-year-old, whatever age someone is, when, when they need community for protection, when they need to be around people for Thanksgiving, right, for Christmas, you know, gang leaders, I say this all the time, gang leaders are community organizers. So if you, just because they're doing negative things does not mean that they're not organizing the community. As a matter of fact, there are Crip and Blood gang members who can get on their phone right now and probably get 50 people at a park right now in an hour. I don't know one activist, including myself, that could probably get 50 people. We were able to get thousands of people when George Floyd was murdered because it was that energy and it was that time. I can't get on my cell phone right now and have 50 youth at a park in an hour. Okay, there are several Bloods and Crips in this city right now, even younger than myself, who have that kind of power with our children, with your children, your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews, right? And, and that's power. And not only do they have the power to get them to the park, they have the power to, to slander someone or to incite violence or, 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 or to say, we don't like this person or we don't like that business or that business owner. You know, and we're talking about a few dozen people, right? And that few dozen people becomes 300 people. So it's all about influencing. We have this term now with social media called influencers. What are influencers? There are somebody who can, we're talking about infectious disease. Influencers are paid to literally infect the minds of mainly the youth. The influencers aren't as effective on 35 to 55 year olds, right? Because you're an adult. But influencers are paid sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars to be on YouTube, to be on Instagram, influencing youth to do stupid pranks, to wear certain brands of clothing, to do violence. Gang members are influencers. They're tough kids. They're smart kids. A lot of the gang leaders are, are ex-football and basketball stars. The, the, the cream and the crop kids who, were, who couldn't go to see you to play basketball who couldn't go to the NFL, but they found a place in the gang, right? And there's community there, and there's camaraderie, and, and there's reputation there, and there's money, and there's sex, and there's all these different things that humans desire. And that's why a nine-year-old, if you see nothing on TV but gangster rap, Snoop Doggy Dog, most young African-Americans you see on TV, they show them in a lot of ignorance. Okay, you don't really see young African-American chess masters. You're not seeing that on television. You're not seeing young African-American organizers or activists, and, and they're made to be propped up as being pro popular, and you should be like them. No, we're, we're showing Snoop Doggy Dog, who's a 52-year-old crip, who has been a gang member since I was, I've been listening to Snoop Dogg. I like Snoop Dogg's music. But I'm giving you an example of who is propped up to our youth. Not Terrence Roberts. I was slandered by the police and gang members who work for the police who have a huge influence over media, over the minds of the youth. But Crips and Bloods and gangster rappers, that's who we elevate. Um, and, and it is a large part of it is the fault of the media. And a large part of it is what we find popular in our own communities. And it's up to men like myself. It is not the media's job to teach our children to be young, viable men and women in the community. It's people who like my job and, and to be an influencer 
And that was why Prodigal Son worked, because we were taking nine-year-olds like your son, hiking, rafting, rock wall climbing. We were cooler than the Bloods and Crips, okay? Our camouflage looked good. We would, we would do things like, let's wear camouflage in orange. And you know, we have like 10 Bloods across the street, and we have like 30 of us. <laughs> and deep down, it's like you could tell the Bloods wanted to hang with us. Because what we were doing was funner than standing on the street corner, probably about to get shot tonight, tomorrow. It's gonna come eventually, right? There's, there's hundreds of Crips in Denver, and like, there's hundreds of Bloods. So um, when we were cooler than the gangs, you seen how the gang violence subsided. But once the gangs became cooler than Terrence, because I'm looking at life in prison and I'm going off on everybody on my Facebook page, and I'm looking like the bad guy, next thing you know, Instead of your son becoming a prodigal son member going hiking or rafting, your son is putting a red bandana on his head because he has to fit in. They'll beat him up. There's no protections there. You can't call the police for protections, especially when the OG works for the police. There's no one to come save your son. Either they, either they, they determine the community is either you get down or lay down. It's either you get down with the movement or we're going to hurt you. You might die. You know, you might live, but you might not live. And, you know, so um, that's how we're going to, that's how we changed gang violence in 2010. And that's how we're going to change it again is picking the right influencers to elevate in the African-American community, having the right conversations. It's not cool to go murder somebody, didn't rap about it. It was cool if it's cool to play football, it's cool to play basketball. I love playing chess. I, I've, I've won two chess tournaments, right? Like, I would rather play chess than sell drugs any day, right? So until we start really elevating the right type of people of color and the media gets off of this lust of the ignorance, uh, and, and there's ignorance in the black, white, brown, all communities have ignorant people, but it just seems like the only, I mean, let me give you an example. They asked Little Wayne, <laughs> about the Black Lives Matter movement. It's like, no disrespect to Wayne, but he's admittedly just only a rapper who raps about drugs, gang banging, being the blood. He's not even a real blood, take it from someone who was a blood. He's a rapper, he, he, is, he is a, he, he is a, um, he's a manufactured, he's been rapping since he's 11. But when Lil Wayne became a blood, the police, blood gang members and Crips could tell you when Lil Wayne said that he was a blood, the blood gang recruitment started growing because he is an influencer. So why are you getting Lil Wayne on 60 Minutes, the, the most probably prominent media program in the United States, and you're purposefully asking this young man who knows nothing about a pro-social movement like Black Lives Matter. He has never promoted it. Why would you ask him about it? And what did he do? He made one of the most ignorant comments in American history as a young African-American about our own movement when there were 10,000 other young black men and women that they could have asked that question to. But Lil Wayne gets on 60 Minutes. As gangster rappers, and negative people in the African-American community that we uplift like these are our heroes. And um, that's why I became an activist to try to change that because I have the same energy and look as a tough gang member, I was one, but I'm so not that anymore that I did want to use my body, my mind, and my level of influence, even if it's smaller, to say I want to, even if it's a small group of kids, let's take them out of this. and. Let's take your nine-year-old son and show him something that's cooler and better than the Bloods or the Crips. And that was my mission at the time. Um, hi. I wanted to say um, to Terrence, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, and to Julian, it's, your research is, is really remarkable. Um, one of the things that I thought was just, um, at least, I mean, it evoked emotion um, within me is, actually watching your video of you kind of going off about your Facebook. Um, I think one of the things that, I think that, that that part is very poignant and I think it's really important for people to see because even though you might've been going through 
a time where you didn't feel like things were going well or that you didn't enjoy, you didn't like seeing yourself in that way. I think the words that you were using and the way that you were communicating is really representative of like how I felt mm -hmm. um, during when Eric Gardner happened, um, when all of these, you know, mass murders of black people. And I think that um, people need to be able to see that. And even though it may not be um, communicated in the way that they might communicate, I think it is a direct depiction of how lots of um, people of color, but specifically black people feel um, when it when it came to um, all those deaths that happen and continue to happen. And I think um, the other thing that is also really important is for young people to see that because even though that may not be how you communicate now, that's still how they communicate. And mm -hmm. I think that that is a way to change the narrative for them to be able to see that there's a, there's another way. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Ashley, for saying that. I appreciate it. So that we have a couple of comments from the online chat that I just wanted to make sure I shared with our speakers and then we'll uh, make sure Anthony has his question asked. Um, so I wanted to make sure I share these comments because I think they're really um, important for you to hear. Mm -hmm. So from Dr. Richards, um, directly in the chat, she says, uh, Terrence, thank you for your dedication to justice and to community health and healthy outcomes. Thank you for your sacrifices. You are making a difference to make strategic, systemic, and sustainable change. Please stay healthy and continue your commitment. We will always support you in your work. Thank you. And we have another comment from um, our colleagues over at the Park Hill Family Health Center. Um, they, they mentioned that in terms of ongoing racism, uh, they found it interesting to see Julian note the 60 million or so dollars that were put in to study health disparities, um, especially related to this particular campus. Um, but then there was also a board of community advocacy in Northeast Park Hill. And like with Prodigal Son, uh, there was a ton of energy spent trying to just get funding. Um, and direct quote, this money still speaks to maintaining the status quo. Okay, uh, first of all, I wanna greet you with peace. Um, there's so much to talk about or could talk about. Uh, during that instance when you were talking to your father and you were kind of apologizing for your behavior then, don't, because that's stress coming from rage. Mm -hmm. And we feel that every day as black people in this country. So, and it's nothing new that's been going on with the gangs and the drugs and the guns. This cycle has been going on for a long time. I'm 63 years old. I grew up in Brooklyn, same thing. Mm -hmm. It just continued on. It's got a little deeper because of the crack cocaine and the access of more guns, but it's the same program. And I wanted to ask you, when you began, when you started your activism, did you have any idea of the powers that be and the limitations that was going to be put upon you? Because black leaders really don't exist in the in the light. You know what I'm saying? From the yeah. '60s, they bumped them all off. And it's been protocol ever since. And if you had a chance, or are you planning on uh, mentoring any youth that are trying to be activists, and how would you go about teaching them in this, you know, how to become an activist without becoming a target to these same things? So to answer your first question, though, I had no idea that I would end up being attacked by my own government. Because even though it was the bloods who came to me, but they were sent by by the government, I was paying my own taxes to it. That should have been protecting me, right? So, uh, I, you know, when I got out of prison, I was just so happy not to be a blood anymore. I was so happy that I didn't have to be afraid to cross Colorado Boulevard. I mean, you know, when, when you're in the gang, you literally, you're living in a box. I wasn't safe anywhere. I wasn't even safe in Park Hill for some of my own friends, but that was the safest place I was, right? So um, I just, I had, a, I had 11 kids in my after school program. That's it. And, and, I didn't seek any media attention. I never thought no one would care about putting me in the news or Julian would write a book. I never, I, I couldn't foresee all of these things happening. 
Uh, I was getting laughed at when I came to Park Hill. All the bloods, everyone was just laughing at me like, he's Terrence, he's the nerd now because they were so used to me being this hardened gang member and some of my own friends didn't even know my name was Terrence. They thought my name was Showbiz. <laughs> they knew that wasn't my real name, but no one ever inquired to ask me about my name. Right, like they just knew me as Biz or Showbiz. So when I'm coming back to the community and I'm wearing collar shirts with sweaters and I'm wearing dress shoes and I'm telling people like my name is Terrence, they were literally slapping their knee, cracking up at me. I'm like, okay, I'm like this is who I am. I don't know what's funny, but this is who I am, right? Like, but then as I started getting more successful, I started getting a little bit in the news and I started growing my program. All of a sudden, everyone started wanting to, wanted to become an activist. So to answer that question, I, I, I didn't think that it would get so big to where other people would want my position because at first they laughed at it, and then eventually over the course of the years, they wanted to become activists because they seen how it changed my life and what it could do for them. They just didn't want to leave the gang. They wanted to do what I was doing, but they still wanted to be OG Bloods or OG Crips, but I'm an activist now. And that's kind of how we start feeling on, because I'm like, no, you can't do both. I'm going to protect the word activism, right? Just like you should protect being a gangster. Why does a gangster want to be an activist? That's how my mind works. Why is a gangster working for the police? Why is a police officer meeting with Crenshaw Mafia bloods? Make it make sense. If I was a police officer, uh, why would I want to be meeting with active gang members that we know are beating women kicking the dog and murdering children. Why? You know, and that's what put me against law enforcement, that put me against the OG gang members who were working for the police, um, which is a problem in communities of color, right? It's been that way since slavery. That's how Nat Turner got caught, because African Americans snitched on Nat Turner, and that's how he got caught. So this has been a problem. And the system has master ways to use our own people who will beat you and kill you as the ones who are like, we don't like Anthony. Why don't you like Anthony? We just don't like him. We don't, we don't like his questions. Well, why don't you like Anthony? Uh, he's the next thing you know, if I'm an influencer, I got half of the group like, well, fuck Anthony. Excuse my language. But that's what they're going to say. Well, shit, if Terrence doesn't like him, Terrence is kind of right, I guess. Right? So i never seen that happening to me. But it happened, right? Because... It, I see why later because we did get successful. And, and you know, when I was telling them, man, you don't have to do this, bro. You can come. You, do you want to go rafting with us? You can come if you want. They was like, nah, man, I don't want to. So as it progressed, I, in hindsight, I could see why they eventually wanted my position. But instead of trying to murder me and kill me and going through the police to get my position, all they had to do was come to me and say, Terrence, since you're moving into that office, how about us use this office? I was like, yeah, I'm done with it. You could have that office. You don't have to kill me to get it. Is Now, what was your second question? Because um, you had, it was like a two-part question. You asked me if I ever foreseen this, and then there was something else. Yeah, if you had an opportunity, or are you planning on mentoring any young activists, and how would you go about training them on to be prepared for not just the Bloods and the Crip, but the other gangs that are out there that are even more powerful that's going to attack them, especially if they become successful. Yeah. So my answer to that is, like, will I ever, like, do a nonprofit again and have to beg the same people for money that I'm protesting? No. Because, like you heard Julian say, if I was to start another nonprofit like Prodigal Son, if I wanted to be able to pay my salary to do it right, because it's a full-time job working with people's children. It's not a part-time job, it's a full-time job. Um, to pay my salary, to have health care, to pay for my children to not become gang members, to pay my rent, um, to be able to take kids hiking, rafting, and camping, that stuff takes a lot of money and it takes a lot of time. And the police have a lion's share of, of the funding of where this youth-related dollars go, I could never say anything about them murdering Elijah McClain. There's not one anti-gang organization in Denver, no disrespect to them, but they didn't show up to not even one action for Elijah McClain or George Floyd in 2020 because they simply cannot. So the way we mentor youth now is when we organize with FPRA, when we organize actions for Elijah McClain, uh, no one has to raise any money. No one, if we make signs, we go to the Dollar Tree and we make the signs, all right? 
Um, we do our own t-shirts. I don't need to ask, no disrespect to the Denver Foundation, I don't need anything from the Denver Foundation. I don't need one penny from them. If anything, I'm giving out donations right now. I'm not rich, but I'm not depending on dollars from the same system that are keeping my people down to also sustain me keeping kids out of the system. We tell the kids to come make signs with us. We make our own bucket drums. We do protests. We invite the kids. Now, our protests did end up getting dangerous towards the end. There were some shootings. Different things happened. So we actually told some of the younger kids to not come. But that is how I mentor the youth, by standing up for more positive things. I can't. I don't have the money to take them hiking and rafting and stuff like I used to. But it doesn't take $500 to meet at Chautauqua Park and to take 10 kids hiking. When I was running my nonprofit, we, we were in a mind state that we can't do anything unless we get a grant. Oh, we need grant money, because I had a wife, I had my own kids, and, and bills need to be paid, and that was a large part. It, it became 60% of my work was chasing money. You know, then the other 40% was me trying to squeeze in a program, squeeze in a meeting, squeeze in a speaking engagement. And it just wasn't working. So my way of influencing the kids now is just, just doing positive things and inviting them in a safe space. You know, we don't need money. We need each other, right? You know, so the currency is love and, and positivity. And as far as me, you know, telling them about what happened to me, we're in the process now of getting out what happened to me. Because still in this city, there, there's a false narrative about the incident that happened with me. There's a false narrative about my attitude and the way I carry myself. Uh, you know, Julian said earlier, it's like I was like outspoken. I, I never tried to be outspoken. I believe in friendship. I believe in camaraderie, and I believe in truthfulness. If if I'm your friend, then I'm not going to throw you under the bus. I'm not going to lie to you. And if I have something hard to tell you, then I'm going to tell you. Because gang members have that type of relationship. Bloods and Crips can fist fight, even shoot each other, and they'll be at the same barbecue together. And eventually, they'll become friends again. Even as activists, we don't even have that type of camaraderie, and we're openly being attacked by gang members, by the police. You know, so I don't really have any lessons to tell the kids, like, don't do this or the police are going to attack you. My lesson to the, to the youth is go hard. If the police aren't, if the, if the police don't see you as a problem, then there's probably a problem with your activism. And I want to make a statement. I'm not an anarchist. I'm not against all police officers. But my focus is justice and equality, OK? If you're a police officer who's not hurting people or murdering people, then you should not be upset with Terrence Roberts. If, if you want the power to hurt people and not get prosecuted, then you probably should not like me very much because I'm not, I'm not here for you. Um, so we don't have a lesson about telling people about COINTELPRO other than if you're a real revolutionary, then this probably, I don't see how you can claim to be a revolutionary and law enforcement does not dislike you. It doesn't make sense. Thank you so much. We're going to have one last question from the chat, and then we're going to have to wrap up. Oh, and there's a question in the back. Let me give you this first. Hi there. Thank you both for being here. Um, Terrence, the video of you was really powerful, and just the way you care for your community in general is really powerful. I'm wondering how do you get people who aren't from the community to care in that way? Because I think part of the problem is people with social power and privilege, they don't always care in that way, even though they could really use that privilege for good. I mean, my answer to that is just being present, showing up. You know, even after all of the media attention that I got when I had to defend myself, it was in the New York Times. That's how Julian came across my story. Um, it was in the Denver Post, all these different things. There are still a lot of people who are in the suburbs in Denver who never heard of me, never heard of even that incident. They don't even think that we have a gang problem in Denver because they don't see it. Denver is not Chicago. You see it in Chicago, right? Denver is not Los Angeles. You see it in Los Angeles. You don't see it in Denver unless you're in Northeast Park Hill or the Five Points. And if you don't have any business over there, there's probably no reason for most middle class white. And there's affluent black and brown people, too. Affluency is not just regulated to white people, right? Like, there's affluent people of color, but if they're not around it and if they don't see it, then they're not going to know. And the way that we're really letting people know what's happening is, is by connecting with journalists like 
like Julian. Julian didn't just tell my story. He told even people who didn't like me. He told everyone's narrative, and then he put it together into this book, right? But I had nothing to hide from Julian, so I wanted to dump it all on him and just let him sort it out, right? Here's everything, right? Whether you believe it or not, this will happen. Um, instead of becoming gangster rappers and making negative things, being more positive and some things maybe aren't for, the, for other people outside of the community. It's not always about making other people outside of the community believe in us, because sometimes that's too much of a problem. It's like, we have to let white people with money know what we're doing. It's like, why? Are we getting any of that money? If not, then let them do what they're doing. And we need to heal our, we need to be more focused on healing our own selves. So when we are presented to communities outside of this, we don't look like we, we are just a bunch of traumatized people. There's trauma in every community. America, there's, I mean, look at the STEM school shooting. Look at the Columbine, you know, shootings aren't, trauma's not just regulated to poor black kids in the hood. Well, we all got a little bit of trauma in here from domestic violence, school shootings, all of that. A mass shooting can happen anywhere in America, and I think we all know that. So um, if people outside of the community want to know, then they can find out, but we're not trying to force ourselves on people outside the community, but we're, we're open. We have thousands of people who are definitely not from the hood who are showing up for our Elijah McClain rallies, and, and when they wanted to tune in in 2020, they tuned in and then they came. And when they don't really want to tune in, there's even people from the hood who are not tuned in. <laughs> Black and brown people was like, I don't want no parts of that. Because I'm a college person, I want to be a doctor. Like. You know, so it's not just us trying to show people outside the community what's going on. We're still trying to let people inside of the community know that we need to change things too. And that's really more of our focus versus showing people outside of the community. Because that becomes entertainment to them. You know, trauma porn is a real thing. And too often we're showing people outside of the community the negative stuff. And we're like begging them for money and begging, just pay attention to what's happening when that's not the only thing happening in the community. There's also a lot of positive things happening too. So, you know, we want to give a proper balance of both. So we're not reaching out for, to people outside the community. I was when I was running a nonprofit because I needed their money. But now I don't need their money. And now it's just like, we're doing this. If you want to come, you're welcome. And if you don't, then, hey, we'll see you later, you know. All right, I think we have time for just one more question from the chat. We had a couple come in, um, but unfortunately, I think we only have time for one more. And the first one that came in um, asks, what are next steps to interrupt systemic racism in Northeast Denver as well as gang activity with youth? So, like I said earlier, I don't have the resources. I will be lying to you guys if I act like I have all of those answers because I don't have all of those answers. Um, it's not like I'm running a prodigal son and I just got an $800,000 grant and I have all these action items. You know, really my answer to that question is we're just going to continue to make sure that the, a lot of gang violence really spills off of how the police are acting in the community too, believe it or not. When the police are bashing people, when Los Angeles was at its worst with gang violence, when they were averaging 700, 800, even 1,000 homicides a year in South Los Angeles, Look at how bad the LAPD were. Look at what happened after the Rodney King beating. The worse the police acted, the worse the gang violence was. The more that we start getting peace with policing, better relationships with police officers in the community who are supposed to um, be in our community, when we start breaking the power that these older gang members have who are working for the police and we start changing the narrative of what makes a, a good young man in the community not being the toughest crip or the toughest blood, then we're going to start seeing the, a decrease in crime and violence again in the community. But right now, young men like myself coming out of prison, I, I don't have the mic. I'm not the person who these young men and women are seeing every day. You go to the Holly right now, it's full of gang members, guys. I would almost be able to guarantee you if you drove your car to the Holly Square after you left this building, there's probably going to be gang members. And I'm not talking about teenagers. I'm talking about gang members that are my age. I'm 45. I'm a grandfather. There's gang members in the Holly older than me, probably literally right now. So I can't fight a bunch of gang members in the Holly. I'm not the police. I'm, 
I'm not that tough, right? I can't go into Holly and punch everybody and clear it out. The way we're going to change the, the perspective and the narrative for Northeast Park Hill and the Five Points and other communities like it is the same way we did it in 2010. Have more positive people who are funded, have more positive people taking those kids and saying, we're gonna leave the community, we're gonna do something else. And, and that's all we can do right now. I don't have the power to fight the Denver police or the FBI or the ATF. Uh, they almost got me a life sentence. I was almost murdered for arguing with them. These are very powerful entities. And I'm gonna talk about Denver locally. Denver has one big machine. You know, you go to bigger cities like Chicago, you may have a few different machines where if you piss off this machine, you may be able to attach to this one. Denver has one big machine. If you piss off Michael Hancock, you're done. Okay, let's just be honest. If you piss off these bloods or crips who work for the Denver police, you're done. A lot of people who are a lot smarter than me and more successful than I am can attest to that. So right now, I don't have the power to change that other than just being a positive person and organizing for the right things, and that's it. Thank you so much, Terrence and Julian. <laughs> Thank you for your time mm -hmm. and your knowledge and your willingness to share your stories, which are tough, and your care for the community. We appreciate it so much. Thanks for having us. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, it. everyone, for coming. Thank you.